we're in Romans chapter 6. Um, I, I know sometimes you, know, you'll, you know, have a week where you can't come or a couple weeks where you can't come. I always want to encourage you to go back and look online. Uh, you can look on through the church website or on iTunes or however you want to do it, but look as we go through because what Paul's doing in Romans is he's building a case. And so if, like, if you miss a certain section, you might wonder, well, what's he talking about? But in the last lesson, we came to verse 11, and he says that the old man is dead. And what is he talking about, the old man? He's talking about that who we were in the first Adam was dead and that we are now in the last Adam, who is Christ. And he said, man, that God has done everything that is necessary to redeem us to himself to free us from what we were as sinners, to make us new creatures in Christ. And we just sing this song. It's, just a, it's a, you know, a, a beautiful song, because right? it reminds us, he who had no sin comes from the, straight from the Scripture. He who had no sin, who was that? That was Jesus. He became sin for us. For what purpose? That we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And so the work that Jesus did is finished. And when Jesus was on the cross and declared it is finished, he was serious. Now, but what's our part in the equation? Well, our part is to reconcile it. Now, we, last week I was talking about how many of you still reconcile your checkbook? I, I do. I know. Like, it's way old fashioned. But how in the world do you know what you really have in your checking account if you don't reconcile it. And he's saying really in a very powerful spiritual way, he's saying, how do you know what's true of you if you don't reckon it so? If you don't practice moment by moment reconciling yourself to God, you've got to remember, you've got to remind yourself what is true of you. And you're the beautiful child of God. You're the righteousness of God in him. You are holy. You are a saint. And it's all because that we have this beautiful union with Christ. Christ lives in us and we are in him. And we have the divine life of God in us so that we are reckoning ourselves now new creatures dead to sin and alive to God. And when we think about being alive to God, we remember that God is not far from us. He is not distant to us. Where is he? He lives in us. And that changes the way we think and the way we feel and the way we act and where we go and how we function in the world. It's so important for us to remember who God has made us to be or we'll never understand what behaviors are normal for us, what attitudes are normal. We're free not only from the penalty of sin, but we are free from the power of sin. So let's jump right in, verse number 15. And he says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Well, Father, I thank you for all the people that came today. And I, I just um, pray that your spirit would have complete liberty to speak through your servant into the hearts of your beloved children. And I know some of this isn't really easy for us to process, but I just pray that your spirit would teach us and reveal to us and illuminate our hearts and that we would see your wonderful working in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So do you remember earlier, uh, I don't know, maybe a month or two back, we were looking at Romans chapter 6 and verse number 1. And the question came up after Romans 5 and laying out all of this, the question came up, should we sin that grace would abound? reasonable question, right? He's saying, well, if the equation is the more sin we have, that God's grace always keeps up with our sin, should we continue to sin to glorify God and to make the sin, the, the grace ever increasing? And what did he say? He says, 
Let it never be, God forbid, impossible. And then he revisits it from a little different portion in verse number 15. Basically the same thing. He says, well, are we to sin because we're not under the law? Because some people say, and this is many people have shared this concern with me over the years that I've been teaching the grace of God and the finished work. They say, well, Pastor Tim, if you teach the grace of God to people, people are going to just go wild. And I always say, you know what? They've already done it. <laughs> it's true. They say, but, but, but what are we thinking? We're thinking, well, what we need, we need the law to keep us from sinning. We need the rules, the Christian rules and principles to keep us from sinning, or we'll, those people will be out of control. And what I want to propose to you this morning is that Paul's coming at this, and he's saying, listen, it's not that we're living under the law because the law doesn't control. We're living under a different principle. I mean, we know the answer to sin, so grace abounds, was let it never be. It is the same in relationship to the law. The question is not, can we, but shall we? The mere suggestion that God's grace is a license to sin is self-contradictory the very purpose of god's grace is to free us from sin to liberate us from its power now can i continue on in a lifestyle of sin just as though nothing had really happened to me except that i will somehow go to heaven when i die because that's how a lot of american christians live they come to it and they say, well, you know what? Uh, I, they hear something of the gospel and they say, well, you know, you're a sinner. And say, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. And do you want to go to hell when you die? Well, no, I don't want to go to hell when I die. We'll pray this prayer and you'll go to heaven when you die. And we pray the prayer and then we think, I'll go to heaven when I die. And then we live our life day by day and nothing changes. And he's saying, wow, that's not the gospel at all. Now, knowing that you go to heaven when you die is a wonderful thing. Even Paul said, what, to be absent from the body is to be present in the Lord. But have you thought about it, that you live every day in the presence of the Lord? And when we shed this physical earth suit of ours, there will just be a deeper intimacy with our creator. But that's why I'm, I'm haranguing you, nagging you, whatever word you want to use, week after week to remind you that you live in union with God. Why? Because I want you to realize the gospel is more than just going to heaven when you die. The gospel is Jesus, your life, Christ, your life today. Christ dying for you so that he can live in and express his life through you moment by moment. I mean, it's more, yes, going to heaven when we die is a wonderful thing. But he came and put his life in us and made us partakers of the divine nature so that we could be establishing as he lives to us the kingdom of God, not in some future event, but in the present. And so it reminds us that we are not under the law, but at the same time, we are not a lawless people. Now, I've shared with you, you know, uh, different times, but how, how many of you have created, well, if you have kids, uh, and Doug was just talking about being with his grandkids, and I think grandparents have much less laws than children, right? I, I know we do, you know. Um, we have very few laws for our grandchildren because they're just better behaved than our children were. <laughs> Something like that, I think, right? Uh, no, no testimonies, nobody wanted. But they're a lot more fun anyway. And so, but the more laws that you have, what happens? And every time you build a new law to control a new behavior, what do they do? They find a way around it. Jesus comes, right, and he, 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 he gives us this beautiful Sermon on the Mount. And the, I think the full intent of the Sermon on the Mount wasn't to show us a new way of living. I think it was to show us the absolute impossibility of living from your own resources and fulfilling the law. 
He says to them, listen, you know, don't com- the, the, the law says don't commit murder, but well, let me talk to you about how about hating your brother. Do we ever find hate in our heart? And he's saying, listen, you know, he talked to the, to the men. He said, listen, you say, you know, you know, the law says don't commit adultery, but I say to you, don't even allow lust to take hold in your thinking. You see, the Pharisees had kind of altered the law so that it seemed to be achievable. And the purpose of the law was not to make us righteous. The purpose of the law was to establish unequivocally that we were all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. But then the amazing thing happens that when we're born again and the Spirit of God comes to live within us, now all that was impossible be- possible becomes a possibility. Because Christ loving in me and through me all of a sudden begins to love even my enemies. You hear the scripture say, love your enemies and bless them who curse you. And you say, no way, never. Just give me a chance to get back at them. One opportunity for sweet revenge. No. He's saying, listen, we were the enemies of God and he loved us. And it allows us to allow him to allows us to f- release him so he can live and love through us so that what was completely impossible when Jesus came and he was doing his ministry on earth. I mean, the Jews had over 600 laws, rules and regulation, over 600 prohibitions and, and commands. Can you imagine it? It was far beyond just the Ten Commandments, but Jesus comes down and he breaks it down into two. Do you remember what the two were? The first was to love the Lord your God. But really, the, the, the meaning of to love the Lord your God with your whole being. And the second is like unto it, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, what Jesus is trying to get us to realize is that when we become a people who receive the incredible, unending love of God, and that love begins to transform it, and we receive it, then we begin to release it into the world as he, as he lives his life through us. And so what he's saying is like, all of a sudden, love is the great commandment. Because when we love, we're not coveting. When we love, we're not committing adultery. When we love, we're not stealing. When we love, we're not murdering. And we, he's saying this becomes a reality. And, and he's saying, listen, you and I, we don't need a, a, a monument for the Ten Commandments in, our, like, you know, in, in front of us to remind us. He's saying, listen, I've given you something far better. I've put my own spirit within you. And he's saying, now you live from this divine union. You live in harmony with who I've created you to be, and you listen to me. When I was growing up, mostly in, in high school, in the early year of college, university studies, you know, I would meet evangelical. I grew up Catholic, so I, my, my whole upbringing was very, very strictly Catholic, and most of all our family I went to Catholic school, so I didn't really know any Gentiles. And... Um, but when I went out into the world, man, all of a sudden I start meeting people, and I'd meet these born again Christians, and you know they would come up to me and they would say stuff like, "Hey, man, do you know that if you died today, you know, that you'd go to heaven? I, uh, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ?" I'm like, "No, nah, I don't think I want that." I mean, most Catholic boys don't want God paying too much attention to them, let alone a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But listen, then one day my eyes opened up and I knew I had a problem with my sin. And I went forward in a service and I put my trust in Jesus Christ and received him as my Savior. And it just changed everything. But, you know, after spending more than 30 years in ministry, I realized something that most American Christians that I know do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't. They know they're going to heaven when they die. And I'm not saying they're not born again. But they walk out of their own wisdom. 
They do what they do because they want to do it. And what I hope that you're coming to the place is that you come to the realization that the Christ who gave his life for you, who died as you and for you, wants to live his life through you in a personal relationship with you moment by moment and day by day and week by week to express his life through you. And so what he's saying is, listen, listen, we're not living under the law, but we are not a lawless people because we have the life of Jesus living within us. And Peter said that we have become partakers of the divine nature we don't follow an external code we've given up on all of the christian rules and principles we 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 live in surrender to his indwelling life we live by a higher law the law of the love of christ we are under grace in order to be free from sin's hold And this is what it's hard for people to to come to grips with because sin is actually slavery. Sin is actually slavery. And it would be folly to be delivered from slavery slavery only to return to it again. Sin Sin is rarely seen as seen by us as slavery. Instead of being Presented as slavery, it's usually described as the very essence of freedom. You know, there are times when, you know, as a shepherd, there's times that it's really frustrating dealing with sheep. I mean, because I want what's best for you. And sometimes I want more for you than you want for you. And I had this very challenge. I had this couple, and they were shacking up, and I talked to them. I went to them. I said, listen, this isn't good for you. This isn't right. And you know what they said? I know what's best for me. I don't get angry very often. But you know what I said? I said, you don't have a clue of what's best for you. Because what you're doing is going to bring chaos into your relationship, bring chaos into your life. You see, friends, it's not about me coming up. We get this idea. I'm like, man, I just, I'm free, and I'm just going to do whatever I want. And so, you know, someone will say, well, you know, I'm free, so I'm just going to look at pornography. Or I'm free, and I'm just going to get drunk every night. Or I'm free, and I'm just going to do this every night. And I'm saying, listen, that's not freedom. That's self-destruction. That brings hell on earth. And you're allowing the enemy to sow chaos into your life. That's the very essence of slavery. I mean, that is what the devil told Eve in the Garden of Eden when he argued, don't be bound by God's word. I mean, if you think back on that story, there's there's a hundred sermons that you could preach just from that that first part of Genesis. I mean, the enemy comes. He says, man, be free, eat of the tree and become as God, knowing good and what? Now, think about how crazy that is and how susceptible you and I are to deception. Because they were living in a garden in a perfect sin-free environment. All the food that they could possibly need, everything they would ever need was right there. And all they knew was good. I would love to live a week in an environment where there was no evil. And Satan comes and says, you know what? God's holding out on you. And he was What was he holding out on him? Evil. Because if God is the only one who's suited to deal with evil. But they thought to themselves, you know what? We too could be like God. And every time you and I put ourselves in the place of being little gods, we're automatically always spending our time discerning good and evil. Instead of living in the good of the presence of God. But that means we have to allow the word of God to have authority in our lives. Because sometimes people say, well, you know, I, I've had people tell me, like, I just think uh, Paul was a misogynist. 
I don't like Paul's writing. I'm like, man, I love Paul's writing. And, well, I don't like this. And I, I'm like, no. Listen and let the word of God be the authority of your life because God, the, the present God in you, living in you, will always do and act and prompt in you what is in your best interest and in the establishment of his kingdom. Look at verse number 16. Do you not know? That if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of, of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Don't you know? He's saying, listen, again, this is something that should be really clear to you. This is something that each and every one of you should understand. That you are who, you are the slave to whom you present yourself. You are a slave to the one you obey. There are just two alternatives. A slave to sin or a slave of righteousness. The one you yield to becomes your master. And so why do I warn you against pornography? Because I don't want you to become a slave to pornography. Why do I warn you against covetousness and greed? Because I don't want you to become a slave to covetousness and greed. Because the master over of sin will always lead your life to chaos. And you have to remember that a slave doesn't serve his own will. Many of you would readily say, initially anyway, oh, I'm a slave of Jesus. But you know what that means? It means you don't do your will, you do whose will. And most of us Americans, we don't like that kind of thinking, do we? What do we do? We want to do what we want to do because we want to, and there's no better reason than that. I was hoping for a loud amen. That's good preaching. Nail us with that, Pastor. No, it, all I heard was, what's the next point? <laughs> I read in a commentary, one of Ray Stedman's commentaries, he had a story, he was amazing. If you, if, you get, if, you, if you want a commentary on a book of the Bible, and Ray Stedman has one, get one. I, I heartily endorse all of his commentaries. Wonderful theologian. But he, he, he was from the Peninsula Bible Church and, in California. And he said that one day, he, in the story he was telling, he said he was down in L.A., and he was driving, and he saw this guy walking with one of those sandwich boards. You remember those? Have you seen pictures of them anyway? And the guy was walking down the street with the sandwich board, and, and when Ray went, went by him, it said the front of the sandwich board, it said, I am a slave of Christ. And as he drove by and looked around at the back of him, it says, whose slave are you? Because the reality for all of his friends is we are all, everyone here, serving one master or another. Some people resist coming to Christ because they worry about losing their freedom. Right? They, but they, they fear if they come to Christ or they surrender to Christ, they'll lose their freedom. But they don't have any freedom to lose. Because they're not doing their own will. Because they are bound and enslaved by sin. So they don't understand their desires come from the evil master sin. If you give way to sensual passions, he's saying, you will be a slave to those passions. If you give way to greed and covetousness, you will become a slave to greed and covetousness. Now, you know, most of you say, well, I don't mind if you preach against pornography. But, uh, Pastor, don't bring up this covetousness and greed stuff. Because that's how we define the American dream. Isn't it? Isn't the, some part of the American dream kind of uh, lined up with the accumulation of more? To where we're looking for the things that we possess to be our security instead of Christ? Never coming to the place where we understand that the things that God has blessed. And please, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying if you got blessed, man, what? Amen. But it's for what purpose? Because if these things, these possessions 
are what you're looking to for security before you know it, your possessions possess you. Instead of realizing that we've been blessed as a people to empower the advancement of the kingdom of God. But don't ever mistake, slavery to sin always leads to death. Always. In Romans the, chapter 3, he said, man, the wages of sin is death. He says, listen, sin leads to death, but it isn't what we are told. It's not what the devil told Eve. He says, do not listen to those who tell you that sin I, I, is harmless. I, I was talking about this earlier. Because people say, oh, and I heard that someone told me this too. Gosh, the things people tell me. I should write a book. The things people tell me. I don't know. I'll, I'd buy the first copy. But the things people, someone told me this. Oh, pornography isn't a problem. Why do you preach against pornography? Pornography is a victimless crime. I'm sitting there like, you know, What? Are, are, are you crazy? Have you never talked to anybody who got addicted to pornography and see how it altered their thinking? How it alters the way they look at the world? How they uh, look at women? And, 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 it, and, and they victimize both themselves and the women involved in it. it. He's saying, listen, it just brings death. It brings chaos. It brings hell on earth. We need to understand it. I mean, people say it won't hurt us anyways. But don't you know that you set in operation a very basic principle of life? If you yield yourself to sin, you become the slave to it. And the result is always death. It's not always a, an immediate physical death, right? Even with Adam and Eve, it wasn't an immediate physical death, but it brought separation in their life. It brought death in their life. It brought contention in their relationships. Sin not only takes you further than we desire to go, but it also infects others with the same attitude. Sin spreads like an infection and ends in death. And we need to remember that we are now slaves of righteousness. Paul isn't saying that we ought to be slaves of righteousness, but that we are already slaves of righteousness. To be a slave of Jesus Christ, that's true freedom. I mean, what is true freedom? It is not autonomy or a license to do absolutely anything at all. True freedom is the ability to fulfill one's life's divine purpose. Do you realize, I mean, because sometimes people get this kind of confused. They say, well, you know, the pastor, he has an anointing to do this ministry. And I hate that when people say that. Because, yes, I do have an anointing. But it makes it sound like you don't have an anointing. Right? Well, that's all on the preacher. Right? I mean, he's got the anointing. We're cool. But don't you realize, friends, that you have an anointing that is equally important and significant and powerful as mine? We have different roles. I'm, I'm a teacher and a shepherd of the, the flock, but this body doesn't function right if everyone doesn't function in their anointing. That, the, the, that, that, that God has a divine purpose for us. Now, most of us Americans, we're just going to work right up until the time we think we have enough financial security that we can retire and then do whatever we want. What I'm trying to propose to you this morning is this, and that's probably the wrong goal. The true, the true definition of real freedom, real liberty, isn't that we don't work and labor to pay our bills and survive, but to finally get to the place where, listen, we're fulfilling our divine purpose as the God's instruments in building the kingdom of God. And that might mean you're a truck driver. And that might mean you're an accountant. And that might mean you're an analyst, analyst or, uh, 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 or, or whatever. But he's saying, listen, 
what I am at my core is a slave of righteousness, and what I do is all about advancing the righteous kingdom of God on earth. That is what it is to be truly free. I mean, this was the promise of Jesus to the disciples in John 8. If you hold to my teaching, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will... Isn't it funny that you all knew that verse? The truth is what sets us free. And the lie does what? It brings us into bondage. It enslaves us. Listen, this is what my heart's desire for you is that you would live in true freedom, fulfilling your divine purpose. Because listen, uh, everything that we think is going to make us happy and fulfilled won't unless it is in harmony with our divine purpose. And you're free for that. No matter what you do for a living. In presenting ourselves to righteousness, we are giving our lives to the indwelling life of God so he can live and express his life through us. Look at verse 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. I I want you to stop right there and, and really think about this. But thanks be to God, and he's speaking to the church, that you who were once slaves of sin. Who in here was a slave to sin? Woo! Me too. Well, a couple of you didn't raise your hand, but I think that was just because you're shy. <laughs> there will be no confessional at the end of the service, so don't worry, you're good. But yeah, that's what we all are. We were all slaves to sin in some form or another. Our sins were different, but where did we get an idea that one sin was worse than another? Sin is sin. Sin has different consequences, but it's all sin. It all produces death. And he says, thanks be to God that you who used to be slaves to sin have become obedient. I love it. This is your destiny. This is your life's fulfillment, not accumulating more stuff. Your life's fulfillment is your obedience To him who calls you righteous. No matter what you do for a living. And you have been set free from sin, having become slaves of righteousness. Now we need to understand that slavery in the Roman Empire was very different than slavery what we had in America. But it was still a horrible thing. And a slave always served the desires of the master. Now, we talk about this, but it's worth, worth thinking about one more time. Why do we do what we want to do? Because we want to do it. I always joke about it. We do what we... Listen, don't, don't get mad at me. Well, you can get mad at me. I don't care. You won't be the first person today. Second service. There's always, at least someone mad at me every week. I, I, I'm not trying to do this to irritate you. I'm just trying to provoke you a little bit. In a good way. We say things like, I do what I want to do because I want to do it and there's no better reason than I want to do it. And listen, I'm not coming at you and saying, listen, I want to tell you what to do. That would be kind of like a cult. I have no interest in telling you what to do, telling you what to give, how to serve, and where to go. I have no interest. I will never participate in anything like it. But I'm here to provoke you and challenge you and to discover what is it, how is it that Christ wants to manifest through you that you, as a slave of righteousness, have a divine anointing and purpose in this life. And this life is way more uh, uh, about that than the accumulation of more stuff. The gospel delivers us from sin. I mean, the verse starts off with giving thanks to God because the gospel liberates us from the reign of sin in our lives. We have so much to be grateful for as those who have been delivered from the tyranny of our former master, sin. 
And while we were still slaves to sin, you and I, we heard the gospel in one way or the other, and someone brought us the good news, and we believed, and our lives are changed forever. But please understand, the gospel is way, way more than just going to heaven when we die. It's about the kingdom now and present. And we are now free to obey. The law, it commanded us to, do, to obey, but never empowered us to obey. And you know what Christ does? He says, not only am I the one who wants to lead your life to rule and to reign, I'm your indwelling power to obedience. So what was commanded and impossible becomes possible for you and I. There's been a transfer of ownership in our life. Several times in Corinthians alone, Paul says, Listen, don't you know I bought you with a price? Now, come on, are we living, honestly living as people who were bought with a price? Or are we living a self-willed life? And all I'm trying to challenge you to say, listen, you think if I live a self-willed life, then I'm going to be happy, but you're not. When you live a life as one who's a slave of righteousness, I don't care what you do for a living. It changes everything. It changes everything. We're free to obey. From the heart have obeyed the doctrine that taught, us, that taught them to experience for the first time, the freedom to obey. Obedience is no longer something uh, that we do in order to, in, in, in our own power, I should say. But through our yielding to his life within us. Obedience doesn't produce or preserve salvation, but it is the fruit of our salvation. And grace produces righteousness. People get worried about it, especially if we're very self-righteous religious people. We get, very, we get very nervous about this. Because we forget there's a transfer of ownership in our lives. Uh, we, we've been purchased by Christ. We're free from the law. But that doesn't mean that we're not obligated under grace to obey him. Because that's what's our good. Do you see it, friends? This is what he has designed for us, our good. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve bought into the lie that somehow God was withholding some good thing from them. But was it true? It was a lie. And this is the same way that the deceiver comes to try and deceive you and I to think that somehow we know, I know what's best for me. No, Jesus knows what's best for you. Would you listen to him? And don't, couldn't, couldn't if we were honest, but we're really not that honest. Um, if we were honest, couldn't we all give a testimony of how we did what we thought was best and it ended up in an absolute disaster? <laughs> I mean, we rationalize things, and we say, oh, yeah, yeah, this is going to work out great. And it doesn't work out that way. Why? Because we were never meant to be gods. Look at verse number 19. I, I am speaking in human terms. Paul is talking to people who lived in a world where the majority of the population were slaves. He said, because of your natural limitations, because of what you understand, he used, I'm using this terminology, because he wants us to understand that we're more than just slaves, we're sons. We're more than just slaves, we're sons. But what I, what I hope you'll see this, because what do we often do in our culture? We often focus on our rights. The, uh, my rights. But when was the last time you ever heard someone talk about my responsibilities? It's kind of void. And he's saying, listen, you're sons, and as sons of the living God, as slaves of righteousness, you have responsibilities. And so he says, I speak these things in present term, for just as 
you once presented your members as slaves to impurity. Is that you guys or another church? Did, did, did any of you at any time in your life ever present your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness? Anyone here? Well, we've cleaned up our accents then, so let's not talk about it. So who's he's talking about? He said, that's who you were. Every single one of us, in one way or another, we had presented our, our members as, uh, to impurity and law, leading to what? More lawlessness. But, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Now, this is an interesting word in the Scripture, because many times in the Scripture, he talks to us as those who have been sanctified, and he also talks to us as those who are being sanctified. And so what you need to remember is that when he talks about sanctification as a fact, he's speaking to our spirit. That our spirit has been made holy, free from sin. But not all of our attitudes or actions are sanctified. Does that make sense? Not, no one's going to get up and say, oh, all my attitudes and actions are completely, 100% represent the life of Christ flowing through me. No. So what is he saying? He said, what you do is present. So my challenge to you this morning is will you present? I mean, sin was normal for the old you. Let's go to that next, yeah. Uh, sin was normal for you, old you. When you were a sinner, sin. But he says, is that who you are? Who are you? You're the righteous children beloved of God. And where is your security? In God. And where does he live? Is he distant to you? Is he way up there in heaven? Or is he living in you? And why does he live in you, friend? So moment by moment and day by day, he can live and reveal his life through you. So that people can see Jesus living through you in your real estate, in your office, where you're a dentist, where you're an analyst, where you're a web designer, where you're a teacher, where you're a truck driver, where, where, or wherever you interact when you're retired. I mean, friends, the picture of slavery shows the total obligation and accountability of the slave to his master. So he says, present yourself to your new master who is God. Present yourself to God, a slave of righteousness. And this is how we close the sermon this morning. There's a step for you to be responsive. Will you present yourself to God? Will you present yourself this morning to your Lord and Master? Will, you, will we, I talk it another way. Will you yield yourself to Him? Well, you know, I've got plans. I've got dreams. And, and there's nothing wrong with having plans and dreams. As long as those plans and dreams are yielded to the indwelling life of God. Would you present yourself to his will? Our old master had nothing good for us. Our old master even told the truth. He said, listen, I want you to know evil when you'd never known evil before. And somehow we bought into that lie. He had nothing good for us, but placed us in ever-increasing bondage and death. And grace has come to liberate us to a life of righteousness. So, we must not present ourselves in any way to sin. Sin is going to come at us. Temptation is going to come at us. It's never going to stop this side of heaven. And some, for some people, it might be, it might be uh, lust. And for another person, it might be greed or covetousness or, 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 or just any number of things. But you got to remember, all the consequence of that is what? Death. 
So I refuse. I, I can't do anything about my temptations in the sense of I can't do something to keep them from coming. You know, and for me, I'll tell you honestly, the ones that I understand and perceive are not the ones that worry me. Like, you know, sometimes you're tempted and you're like, wow, that's bad. Well, those aren't the ones that worry me because I see them. They're bold. They're audacious. They're obviously contrary to who God wants me to be. The ones I'm worried about, the ones I don't discern. The subtle ones that get into my thinking that seem very very justified. There's probably no other rationalist in here in the sense of you have an ability to rationalize almost anything. So pray for me. Because that's where I get in trouble. But grace abounds to liberate you to a life of freedom. I want you to live free. I want you to live free, and I want you to experience your full potential as the child of God, the loved of God, the righteous servant of God, which expresses itself in righteousness. So you present yourself this morning to God, a slave to righteousness. To where we come to the place and say, Lord, Whatever you want to do. Whatever. However you want to manifest and reveal your life through me, here I am. Lord, what, what do you want to give through me in building your kingdom? I'll give it. Where, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? How do you want me to love and be loved? And let can I just add this one little thing before I close? If you don't learn to live in the love that God has for you, poor neighbor. Because you will always live out towards your neighbor how you perceive God's love to you. You love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if you don't love you, I'm not talking about a narcissism that's all self-absorbed. I'm talking about really living as one who is loved and accepted. You'll never love and accept others. You'll always have conditions. Well, Father, thank you for these dear folks. And I, I pray that somehow your spirit would bring it all together to resonate in their minds and their hearts. And Lord, that we would right now present ourselves to you to experience as a people true freedom which means to fulfill our divine purpose anointing and calling in this life and i ask it in jesus name amen